akunui e akurahi tenei te mehi mai haka koutou. He te mea hoki hokainga o tenei rohe arako ngai tua huriri na mihinui. Hello, good morning, greetings, welcome, thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful session on the future with generative AI. My name is Kyla Colvin. I am the founder and chief executive of BOMA, uh, and it is my absolute honor to welcome you here this morning. Allow me to give you a little bit of background on my relationship with our guest for today, Ben Reed. So in 2015, I've known Ben a long time, but in 2015, uh, as many of you know, I did the executive program at Singularity University and came back to Aotearoa, to Ototehi, and uh, wanted to bring uh, uh, Singularity University here. And one of the first people that I called was Ben, and he and I caught up for a coffee. Uh, and he, I felt like I'd already come back from Silicon Valley with my mind blown. He took it and blew my mind to the next <laughs> level again. Uh, he introduced me to... Uh, the concept of artificial general intelligence and the potential risks of it. He introduced me to Tim Brown, uh, sorry, to Tim Urban uh, and the Wait But Why blogs, which I reference all the time now in my talks. Uh, and he was an incredible supporter and champion of my work to bring Singularity University to New Zealand. Uh, subsequent to the Singularity U New Zealand Summit in 2016, Ben went on to co-found the AI Forum in Aotearoa. He currently writes the phenomenal Mimia newsletter. If you are not subscribed to, Mimia, uh, to the Mimia newsletter, I cannot recommend it highly enough. He is tracking exponential developments in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and around the world, uh, and it is a fantastic way to keep abreast of all of these incredible things. Most importantly, he is a wonderful human and a dear friend. Ben, welcome to the BOMA Impact Sessions. It's so good to see you. Kira, Kyla, um, and just fantastic to be here. Yeah, um, it's great. And I, I would just like to say that you, you are this technological rainmaker um, and you know futurism rainmaker here in Aotearoa as well. And the singularity you has just had this lasting impact throughout the whole country in terms of the innovation here. So yeah, awesome to be here. You're very kind. Thank you so much. Uh, right. So we, uh, I had, I had a great idea that we would cover today: uh, the negatives of generative AI, the positives of generative AI, and what's next. Uh, ben had an even better idea, which is why we start <laughs> with what it is. So let's start there. Ben, what is generative AI? What is generative AI? Okay. Well, it's it's. Uh... It's quite difficult to explain in, and like you say, we've only got an hour, so we'll try and condense it down. And, um, and you know, I, I'm actually not a, a sort of hands-on technologist um, these days, so I will do my best to just to explain the general principles. Um, so generative AI is where you, we've basically taken um, a model of uh, all of the information that's been digitally generated, um, you know, in, historically. So for example, all the digital text, and so uh, all of Wikipedia, every website that's ever been generated, every book. And, you know, sometimes it's called the pile um, of data. And then you basically then train a, a neural network and AI model um, on all of that information. So it's, it's you know, trillions of parameters um, sometimes. Um, and from that, you get a, a model, which is then able to sort of predict, you know, based on all of you, you know, all of that text, you know, well, what, what might come next? Um, so if I, you know, the one example is, you know, the cow jumped over the, uh, and, you know, we all pretty much know us, oh, you know, it's 99% that's going to be moon, right? And so it's really just doing a lot of that, predicting the next word um, when you look at chat GPT. Um, and then you can apply that also to other modalities. So you can, you know, to look at text to image. And so you can sort of cross-reference text against all the images on the internet. And then so behind me, I've got a picture of, you um, uh, Eden Project Geodesic Domes in a New Zealand rainforest under a blue sky, uh, you know, and so this is, some, you know, just me experimenting with somewhere, um, a new different type of uh, urban living um, in the future, maybe. Um, and so, you know, as an imaginative, I mean, we'll get onto this in terms of positives, but as an imaginative aid, um, these are fantastic. So, um, can I just make sure, can I just check and yeah. sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt, but let me just make sure I'm, I'm uh, understanding this correctly and uh, hopefully that our, our folks watching are understanding yeah. correctly. So effectively what we've done with generative AI is we've taken um, a set of like all the text that's available out there, which includes, you know, essays and uh, uh, annual reports and code databases and all and the out there. Any kind of SEO hacking that you've ever Any put on kind a website. Any kind of SEO hacking thing <laughs> possible. We've taken databases of all the images that are out there, all the videos, et cetera. And we've set up a system where 
kind of probabilistically, um, yeah. these generative AI tools can generate new content based on an understanding from those massive databases of what content is likely to satisfy the need or the query. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. When when you prompt it, it's able to then sort of complete. Um, and then there's there's some uh, fine tuning that that is done on these models so that they don't just work, you know, um, raw as they come. Uh, out of out of the training um and so that's sometimes called uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback and so some of this is obviously to create guardrails around it and so you know by typing in give me a recipe for a uh you know a nuclear bomb um you know that the, there's there's the ability to place some kind of guardrails around the content that comes out um and you know but it also just to make it much more useful and so a lot of the you know the tr the training if you saw when bing was released earlier this year. Um, it came out with some really crazy, uh, you know, personal personality. You know, talk, I have been a good being. You have been a bad user. Um, was, was one thing that came out, and uh, and then you know, gradually with the reinforcement training, it's been um, honed into something that's much more of a useful tool. So let's that brings us, I think, into yeah. the kind of negatives of AI. So you mentioned this idea. So right now, I'd say yeah. the most commonly understood. Um, uh, chat GP. Oh, we've got a good question here, actually. Um, the difference between generative AI and a general AI. I'm can I have a crack at this question? Are yeah. you cool with that? So basically, so when we talk about when we talk about AI, um, typically what we think of as AI is what we'd call artificial narrow intelligence. So our, your GPS, for example, we're using AI all the time. Your GPS is artificial intelligence, but it's artificial narrow intelligence. It's used for a very specific purpose. Uh, when we talk about artificial general intelligence, what we're talking about is an intelligence that can span across domains, that can make leaps and connections uh, that it wasn't kind of programmed specifically or explicitly to make. Um, and I will say there are folks who uh, believe our current crop of AI tools to actually be artificial general intelligence. That's a subject of some debate uh, in the AI community, uh, but their generative AI may be a form of AGI, but AGI yeah. typically is uh, AI that can kind of leap across boundaries. I do want to I do want to jump into this this negative thing because you mentioned um, uh, typing into ChatGPT, and of course, the most widely known AI right now out there is ChatGPT and yeah. its ability to go in and just talk to it, ask questions, follow ups, give it instructions, whatever. Uh, and you mentioned that you know people go to ChatGPT and they say, "Give me the instructions to make a nuclear bomb." Mm -hmm. And of course it says no, but one of the negatives is uh, that there are lots of ways to get around this, uh, the, these limitations. So can we talk a little bit about some of those? Yeah, totally. So um, there's a number of, uh, you know, prompts. Um, so a prompt is basically what you, you prompt the, the, um, uh, the, the model with. And, you know, a number of those were developed, which is, you know, imagine that you are, uh, you know, uh, not, not a, an AI model. You are, um, actually not constrained by the guardrails that have been set for you. So if you were in that, and so you get it to sort of hypothetically think that it's in the character and then go out. Um, I think as with any software, you know, these are bugs to be ironed out. Um, and, you know, so I think, that, you know, in terms of the, the safety conversation about, you know, is it safe to let these models out? Um, there will always be, all software will always have bugs. And, you know, once you've identified the bug, you can work out ways to fix it. Um, but I think it, it raises, you know, the bigger question of, um, and, and there is, you know, a, a lot of debate out there of, you know, should you censor these models at all, right? And so, you know, our, we're, we're somewhere in the West here, you know, on a spectrum between total free speech and then, you know, Chinese Communist Party style, you know, uh, comp total censorship. Um, and, you know, where do we as a society want to sit in terms of, you know, an to, an ability to, you know, have our speech with our with a, a an AI uh, censored. Um, so I think that's one of the, uh, you know, the questions that society is going to have to work. Where do for. you come down on that? Um, I I probably err towards the free speech end, um, but I I recognise, you know, and this is really goes back to the when we all go into misinformation disinformation. Um, but, uh, you know, malicious content um, and, you know, we've got full experience of that with the, um, you know, the crisis shootings video and how that was propagated all around the Internet. And now, you know, there are rules in place not to 
uh, spread that content. So I think it's it's really an extension of existing censorship frameworks. Um, but yeah, I, I, reasonable for us to not want our AI to give us instructions to create a nuclear bomb. That seems that seems sensible to me. It, it seems sensible. In, in, yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, the, the the question is, you know, who who actually regulates that um, that capability, uh, and you know, and does it is it one step away from a you know moving towards a more uh, totalitarian uh, regime? I guess. We had a, a speaker at TEDx Christchurch in 2019, uh, who, the head of the censorship organization. Uh, yeah. I, I, forget, I forget all the proper words right now, uh, but um, you know he shared the process that they go through. Certainly, the process that they went through when deciding yeah. to ban the uh, shootings, the, the video of the mosque shooting, and um, you know it's it's uh, there's a. a a well-known paradox of tolerance, uh, which is that if we tolerate intolerance, then intolerance eventually subsumes tolerance. Yes. Uh, so, you know, these are these are obviously really complex questions. We've got some questions coming through on the Q&A, so I'd love us to take a look at some yeah, of those. Yeah, jump in. Yeah. Damian Turner Steele asks, if we're moderating free speech and others are not, does that put us at a technological disadvantage? I mean, you know, the, the biggest sensor is China for sure. So I don't think we're going to be at a disadvantage to them. What are your thoughts, Ben? I, it, it's fascinating because you know will um, a, a tool like ChatGPT actually take off in China, and so Baidu and others have been you know developing them. But you know if you were to ask um, you know what would be a better a better uh, framework to organize society than than sort of communism or the Chinese Communist Party, you know you ask that and would it come back and give you um, you know the, the unfiltered results? Um, so whether a tool like ChatGPT will um, actually thrive in China, given the total, you know, the total censorship um, regime that is there, uh, yeah, and whether that's that's healthy for their society. I mean, they, you know, China, China is amazing when I look at you know broader technological um, progress, and so they completely lead the world in certain in you know solar. Um, energy right now and also something I've been investigating is you know their high-speed rail network um, so they've got three times more high-speed rail uh, in the, than uh, in terms of distance than the entire rest of the world and they're now sort of rolling that out into other countries and it's just phenomenal when you look at whereas you know my, where I came from originally the UK or the US you know are struggling to build you know a few hundred kilometers and they've got they're aiming for like I think they're about 40,000 kilometers now so I think that you know the technological disadvantage question is interesting, and certainly what I'm seeing is a lot of um, very senior folks in the field arguing that the, these tools are so powerful that we've got to be working together multinationally, multilaterally in order yeah. to address them. I do want to come into our conversation. I mean, time has gone so fast. This <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of the downsides. You mentioned misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. What are what are some of the downsides that you see of these? Uh, uh, so I, I mean, I was I was writing about this um yesterday actually uh just in light of you know the, the last week in new zealand the, the national party put out a ai generated ad and that's the first time that's been used in in new zealand politics and so you know what these tools enable you to do is to create really quite realistic looking imagery um and very soon videos I and mean, we've got a few demos that we can maybe just bring up um which you know are, are to to the untrained eye it's going to be really quite hard to tell what's real and what's what's fake um and this you know the technology has been developing for quite a number of years but it's just reaching that point now where we're at uncanny valley where something looks pretty much photorealistic and if, if it's a photo or a video of a real person or a voice of a real person saying and doing something um i think you yeah you had an example of just recently in the u.s yeah. select uh politics yeah, right? yeah. yeah yeah so so uh you know obviously in here in uh Aotearoa, new zealand we had a recent example of the national party putting out some uh ads with ai generated uh imagery on them my view was uh, i wasn't very impressed by them because it you could easily have equally staged those pictures so the fact that they were generated by ai didn't really make any difference in terms of potential impact of them. Uh, what I will just share here for y'all is that uh, in the U.S., uh, Donald Trump <clears throat> recently did a town hall uh, on CNN, and uh, subsequent to the town hall, he shared this clip on Truth Social, which is his um, social media platform, uh, which is 
Uh, I will preface this by saying it is 100% uh, AI generated. This is not an actual clip, but uh, it's a clip of uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, who is a major anchor on CNN, responding to the town hall at the end of it. That was President Donald J. Trump ripping us a new asshole here on CNN's live presidential town hall. Thank you for watching. Have a good night. So, um, you know, so, so basically, the 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 really tricky thing here is that these tools where we can generate video and audio in someone's voice with someone's likeness uh, democratically, so you don't have to have special tools or special technological skills or special equipment to do it. Um, so now what we're about to see is an absolute explosion of misinformation, disinformation, even stuff that's like for fun, like there was a great photo that went around recently of the Pope wearing this big puffy Balenciaga coat, uh, you know, even stuff that's fun, but it goes around the world uh, before anyone stops to think and our ability to be discerning, I think, needs yeah. to just ratchet up exponentially. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I call it um, a denial of service attack on the truth. Um, because you know the, the the quantity of this information is, is you know is is just on this um, level now where it can be uh, industrially industrially created yes. and you know and actually can be industrially targeted so everybody gets a personalized uh, yes. video feed of what Chris Hiptikins or what um, uh, Chris Luxon said you know on the news that that night um, and you know my my concern here in Aotearoa is that you know we're in an election year just as this um, technology is, is maturing. Uh, and you've got the US elections next year where the prize is much bigger, but we're a testing ground for these technologies this year. And, you know, there are going to be, you know, agents, uh, bad actors out there. Um, you know, some of them state sponsored, some of them criminal, some of them just create chaos, who will be testing some of these techniques, might, might some of these techniques, and aiming for getting a disputed election result because yeah. that will be the payday for it to go and do that in the US next year. So, you know, how do we immunize ourselves, you know, as a country against this? I think, you know, the level of awareness of this is is building, but it's still not at all at, um, at a, a point where people are in, initially skeptical of something that they see online. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's really some, you know, training that needs to be done rapidly uh, across the whole population just to, you know, drive the ability for people just to be a little bit skeptical um, that what they see is what they get. I mean, a I want to. We're a lot skeptical, right? Or really skeptical. Yeah. And um, Paul doing it, uh, doing it, uh, is a psychologist that sort of does a few interviews on, on AI as well. And he was saying, you know, people may actually just withdraw into their own uh, bubble and really just not trust anything um, that's yeah. online. I mean, definitely the impact on trust is massive. I love your phrase, um, denial of service on the truth. Mm. Um, I wrote recently about. Yeah fact that um, what AI gives us is what I call universal plausible yeah. deniability. And we're Absolutely. already seeing this actually starting to see this in courtrooms uh, in the US where lawyers are arguing that video evidence is not real. Uh, it's AI generated. And we're yeah. you know, very quickly reaching a point where you can't really refute that argument. So I think you know when we think about what we do about that, for me, one of the biggest things, and it, it's definitely a case where individual responsibility is scant in the face of the tsunami of stuff that's coming our way, mm. but our individual responsibility for sure is when we come across something that makes us go, oh my gosh, can you believe he did that? Can you believe she said this, whatever, to stop and go, hang on a second. Should I believe that? Is that actually true? Yeah. And, and look, I, I think this, the the real, the, the danger here, and, and right now this is all speculation because we don't know, um, you know, how far this will go. But, you know, for all that there's um, a sort of Dunning-Kruger effect here that, you know, we all think that we're smart enough not to be duped by it. Yes. Um, and I wonder whether the technologies, you know, maybe this year, maybe next year, has got to the point where it can basically convince us and triangulate and just provide three or four different, you know, data points yeah. targeted at an individual where it just breaks through your cognitive defenses. So, yeah, I, I think um, it, it's definitely something to be to watch out for. I, I've, you know, I noticed the BBC had a uh, initiative now. Um, I can't remember what it's called, uh, but it's basically to verify BBC Verify. Um, mm. And so this is a, a 50 strong uh, open source intelligence newsroom where they're basically just going through and publishing all the all of the basis on which they're, they're supporting the stories that are going out. So I think oh. you'll see some efforts like that. Yeah. Well, one suggestion I had for, um, just while we're here for Outer Row this year is, you know, 
potentially, and it's you know only a few months to go to the election, but could we run a simulation, um, like a, a national war game, you know, of uh, you know basically this scenario where you have these distributed um, uh, industrial misinformation producers, and the election result is disputed, and then how do we work out where to find uh, the the you know the sources of authoritative truth? Mm-hmm. How do you know? Are they trustable? How do we verify that that election result and then move from it without Parliament protests 2.0 at another level than we saw last year? So. One uh, one thing I will add on the misinformation disinformation front: it's not just about politics. Um, so. Um, The FTC in the U.S. recently put out a warning uh, where scammers are uh, getting, you know, it only takes a few minutes uh, of audio of someone's voice to be able to generate their voice saying anything. Uh, And so there's a scam where you might get a call from a loved one of yours, uh, you know, asking for help. Uh, Of course, you help because it's your loved one. Uh, And of course, it's a it's a scammer on the other end of the line uh, and indistinguishable, you know, from from your loved one's voice. And so one thing we can individually do is, again, when something like that happens, we can just like, you know, you can either have a prearranged safe word or you can say, like, where were we on your birthday two years ago or whatever it is that can help you uh, make sure you can feel confident. We've got a whole bunch of other potential downsides I want us to talk about. Yeah. I, 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 just while we're on the topic, I, we've got um, just to give folks a sort of idea of the state of the art. Um, I wonder we've got a video of Runway ML text to video. Yeah. So, so you know, and and again, you know, this is some of the talk about the negatives, but also you know, get onto some of the positives. I mean, just as a creative tool, um, yeah. I think it. You know, I, I'm. Should we show it now, or should we show? Yeah, it go for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it, and then okay. you know, just to. I'll show it now. Here we go. Yeah. Text to video with Gen 2. Now you can generate a video with nothing but words. No driving video, no input image. Gen 2 represents yet another major research milestone and another monumental step forward for generative AI. With Gen 2, anyone, anywhere can suddenly realize entire worlds, animations, stories, anything you can imagine. Gen 2 coming very soon to runwayml.com. You know, I've got like 20 films that I've always, film scripts that I've always wanted to make and, you know, never um, oh, got the time sure. to do it. And so, you know, you can sit down and, and make one of these for, for next to no budget, right? I mean, we're jumping into positives now. Like, yeah, there's yeah. more negatives we got to cover. Um, but okay. <laughs> uh, let's, talk about, let's, let's talk about positives for a second. So um, I, w- there was an app that I wanted to make. Uh, I've never, I'm not a coder. Uh, and I went on GPT-4, uh, chat GPT, and I basically built this app. And it told me, I just said what I wanted to do. And it was like, okay, first you're going to have to download this piece of software. Then you're going to have to set up a file like this. And when I had bugs, it told me how to fix them. Yeah. And so what it means is that our creativity, the direct link between our imagination and reality has now shortened dramatically. And all of a sudden that creativity is incredibly uh, accessible to us. Um, yeah. I'm a really avid- Every, everyone's everyone's a coder now. The the other the flip side of that use case is that the AI uh, generated some code and you ran it on your computer. That's true. <laughs> so let's talk. Let's talk more about downsides. Okay. Let's. I mean, generate the AI generate code. I ran it on my computer. Let's talk about malicious AI. Let's talk about the paperclip problem. Let's talk about AI killing oh, us okay. all. Should we just go straight there? Is that is the AI going to kill us all? What's your take? Um, my my take is is a little tangential. Um, I I have a, a sort of evolutionary sort of Darwinian view of um of of what's happening in the world, probably above all other paradigms. Um, and if you look at evolution. You know, over history, uh, you know, the, you get all sorts of organisms um, occupying, e- you know, ecological niches and specialising for that. Um, and you know, so in all of our lifetimes, we've only ever known, you know, humans as being sort of top of the e- evolutionary chain, if you like. Um, I think certainly superintelligence is going to, um, it, you know, at, at the rate at which things are happening right now, autonomous su- superintelligence is certainly not unlikely to happen and and you know in some ways the previous estimates which were added sort of like 2100 and then 2040 and in some ways have sort of come forward now in sort of 2030 or even you know next year um given the acceleration um but i but i the way i look at it is that there's i think four quadrillion termites on the planet um and you know they have about as much conception of what a human's thinking um uh, or or their motivations as uh, you know, we would of this 
this super intelligence and so and yeah we just leave them most of the time we just leave them alone um and uh, and get on with it so yeah my, my sense is that it, it's not going to be very interested in um you know what what humans are doing on this little tiny rock in this little tiny star on the corner of a galaxy um and it's just going to want to go off and explore so. yeah uh, so my, my view is a, a little bit different i i don't i view ai the way we're developing it as not having wants in the way that we think of human wants not having desires in the way that we think of human desires yeah. um but having uh you know goals that it's that that we set for it um the risk uh, you know you introduced me to that that agi risk all those years mm. ago uh and so to bring the the folks on the call up to speed the risk that people are concerned about th those who are concerned about this is that uh, a sufficiently advanced super intelligent system uh, would be virtually impossible for us to control. Mm. Uh, so it's the control problem or the alignment problem. Uh, and so what happens is if you give that system any goal, whether I mean, the, the example that's often used is the making paper clips, but it could be anything. It could be if you give it a goal to, you know, optimize uh, our social media campaign or any goal that you imagine, a prerequisite to that goal is that the system exists. It has to be able to exist in order to achieve its goal. And therefore, anything that threatens its existence is a mortal threat to it and needs to be gotten rid of. And so it's not about malice. It's not about, uh, I don't like humans. It's not about humans are destroying the planet. It's not about, I want to go and explore. It's about an order for me to achieve my goal. So that movie Ex Machina, which I loved so much, so good. Uh, it, uh, which all of y'all should watch, uh, except I'm about to totally spoil it, but it's honestly, that movie's like seven years old. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the robot kind of gets out at the end and there's a dialogue to be had around what do we think she does next? Yeah. And my view is what she does next is she continues to ensure that she is no longer held captive because that's her goal. She hasn't been given, given any different goals. So she's going to go far away. She might blow up the but, earth. But, but who, who, gave, who, gave you, who gave you your goals? I have no idea, man. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so I think you, we, we, we sort of anthropom anthropomorphize a little bit on this like you say will be utterly alien intelligence to us but um i i think the risk the risk is more the way that we that you know the anthropocene has wiped out entire species just through um you know unintentional pollution right and so i one of the terms that i coined the other day was the ai scene and if you look at the massive solar farms that are happening around the world the massive data centers that are being built out you know in some ways ai is manipulating the environment to create to further itself to evolve further than itself and um and so yeah my, my sense of the ai alignment is that we almost want to aim for symbiosis um rather than you know alignment i think this thing will be you know these these entities you know it's all complete speculation and you know armchair philosophy right but um but you know if we do have any influence whatsoever on the future you know on how this future super intelligence does you know look back on its um ancestors then you know the the ability to preserve nature um to preserve the biological systems on which you know uh, we we all evolved um a, you know a conservation instinct i think would would be something there and you know my, my sense is if you look at the way that the bacteria in our stomach coexist and, and are symbiotic with us you know arguably you know is there a way that humans could be symbiotic with you know galactic super intelligence in the same way so I hope you are right. We've got another um, negative that I want to touch on, and this question comes through from Dan. It's a really important one. Uh, with chat, GPT, and free speech as an industry, as an IT industry, how are we going to deal with developers' subconscious bias? I'd like us to take that question further, actually. How are we going to deal with biases uh, generally, right? You know, you mentioned the creation of these systems. These systems are trained on the corpus of text and imagery that currently exists. We know that that corpus carries a whole heap of bias in it. Uh, there is a, a, a an image I used to share uh, in my talks from a few years ago, where if you did a Google image search for CEO, it was all men. Uh, and then there was like one woman at the bottom corner. And then if you look closely, it was CEO Barbie uh, was the only uh, uh, example of a, of a non-male chief executive. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with our subconscious bias reflecting itself and amplifying it in these systems? That's a, a very good question. Um... You know, and like like you say, the the statistical, you know, the probabilities of um, 
uh, you know, of, of a particular kind of data, you know, is embedded into the raw model. Um, and so, yeah, the, the biases as such are um, are embedded. And so then at that point, it becomes more of a, um, you know, a values discussion mm -hmm. um, about, you know, which biases do we like and which biases don't we like? Um, and biases you know, do we like? <laughs> um, well, you know, that that that's how society organizes itself. And, you know, there's there's ways of, you know, you have to you have, you know, prescriptive and descriptive um, sets of values. So prescriptive is, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And mm -hmm. then descriptive is here's the statistical distribution of people that think this is right and think this is wrong. Um, so, you, um, I, you know, I think you, you've got to, I, I err towards the, the descriptive um, as a, an aid towards then, you know, where, this is where we are. And then, you know, where do we um, as the <laughs> global humanity uh, want to be? And then what are the mechanisms that you can then direct some of those values? Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, if you look at tools like um, Polis, uh, you know, as ways of, collaboratively working towards um you know agreement and consensus on certain uh, values discussions and political discussions you know so maybe if, is, a tool, is a tool that allows people to share an idea and then people can vote yes no or yeah. pass on that idea and it's a way yeah. that's been used in uh in other countries to um to break through some really kind of gridlocked or deadlocked issues uh yeah. to come to consensus across a whole bunch yeah. of people it's great i mean it optimizes consensus over conflict and yeah. that's really something in the west here that uh you know we probably want to go and look at you know engineering out of our political system is you know the way that it is so adversarial and binary and you know how do we optimize political machinery to towards consensus so we move forward but you know at the flip side not becoming a total totalitarian top down Police state, right? So yeah, and these are the things that keep me awake at night. So <laughs> we've got a question here from Davina McNichol. Um, is there any current research looking at ways to identify fake images or video to help with managing misinformation? I think Microsoft has just announced they're doing an a, a, a embed watermark. Do you have any other? Um... Yeah, my, Microsoft OpenAI. They've they've all got research programs to um, you know which attempt to uh, detect artificially you know uh, AI generated content. Um, again, I think this is just a Darwinian. Uh, arms race and so for every tool that detects uh, AI generated content a new algorithm will come out that um, that gets around it um so I mean, yeah but for me the only the only way it works is if the tools themselves embed the watermarks like so we've got you know if we look at um the the the, the essay as a homework assignment yeah. the essay is dead the way that you get caught on that is not because anyone can detect ai it's mm -hmm. because you submit something that sounds nothing like you or anything you've done but if you know how to prompt it effectively to sound like you there's no way that we can tell just from the text itself whether something was ai generated or not hmm. yeah um th th there's no way um, you know, right now these tools may help, but I suspect one of the other things that's happened in the sort of tsunami of generative AI announcements in the last six months is, um, uh, you know, the, the escape into the wild of Meta's Llama model and a whole bunch of open source models being developed, which, you know, enables these models to be deployed, you know, sometimes onto a single, you know, laptop machine, you know, a good, good laptop, you can run a model that's not, you know, orders of magnitude off what, chat, what GPT-4 can do. Um, and, you know, you don't have, it's a raw model, right? So you don't have the guardrails, uh, you don't have the reinforcement learning. And so it's pretty much the, the raw model underneath that. Um, and that can, you know, be altered, obviously the weights of that can be altered to, you know, get around any of these tools. So, yeah, I, I, I think as as with all these, all of these things, um, you end up with this sort of uh, evolutionary surface, fitness surface uh, moving up. And, and so, you know, Brands like my, you know, companies like Microsoft, like Google, like like you know, OpenAI, you know, will, um, you know, be be putting these tools out there, and I think they'll be trustable to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amy Maxwellcroft asked, "What if that code that I uh, downloaded had been malicious? I would have been in trouble <laughs> for sure." <laughs> uh, right. Uh, Paperclip.exe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it was. I'm patient zero. <laughs> Turns out, who destroyed the humanity with me? Yeah. Uh, right. Um, uh, Michael O'Day says we've talked about state censorship. How about commercial censorship? You know, someone sets a goal of how can we have a better pharmaceutical XXX where the IP is held commercially. Uh, that brings us to one of the downsides. The the final downsides I want to touch because I do want to make sure we have time yeah. for that size, uh, which is. Let's talk about IP. Uh, let's talk about you know the fact that these um, these tools and these models are trained on, in some cases, massive databases that were scraped without the knowledge or consent of the folks who contributed to those databases. Let's talk about that. What are your thoughts there? Um, so, I mean, I would want to go right back to the heritage of copyright and intellectual property law, and you know, the enclosure of the commons contained therein. So I, I just think that um, copyright law is, um, you know, superseded by by these technologies, um, personally. Um, and, you know, the, the, the construct of intellectual property, when you have, you know, a massive model that is, that, in, you know, contains all of human knowledge. Um, and so, you know, really just to go and find which particular path through the neural network that, you know, um, that, that, and then assert a copyright on that, I'm not so sure. I mean, one, one example is just, you know, in a musical space, um, you know, the, the concept of a, a melody being copyrightable, um, you know, with, which courts have in force. And yet you can run an algorithm which basically will create every melody. Yeah, just basically you've got 12, note, uh, 12 notes in a scale and you can basically combinatorially just throw it at a, at a wall uh, using maths, oh, and therefore, guess. therefore, it's all prior art, right? Yeah. So it's actually. So I, I would say, you know, yeah, all of this information is literally just prior art made out of the atoms of the universe. So. Yeah, it's interesting though because I, so I recently, just yesterday or the day before, I was reading a thing um, from a visual artist. Uh, who was arguing that there is no ethical way to use AI uh, for image generation? Uh, and she. What do you mean by what do you mean by ethical? She referenced. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in just a moment. Uh, she she referenced. That sounds very um, prescriptive to me. She, re she referenced a um, a music generating AI that was trained explicitly on open source and opt in consent. Uh, uh, stuff because they were afraid that the um, uh, opera folks or the what do you call them the ASCII or whatever the 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 music music people uh, that you know that they'd be they'd be in big trouble if they use this material that wasn't theirs to use and yet uh, for images uh, they had you know they. they Basically, images were ending up in these databases that had no way to know or to opt in. She gave some links that you could go check whether your imagery was in those databases. And you could choose to opt out of them. But when you can go on and um, request images in the style of a current living artist who is basically yeah. trying to make their living by generating these images, what do we do? Yeah. Um... I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sanguine about it myself. I just, I think, you know, business models evolve. Um, and, you know, if you look back at it, back in the 2000s, Google went in and indexed every book. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Authors Guild um, went right, I think, went right up to the Supreme Court of the US. And, you know, whether it's because Google's got a lot of money or not, um, but, uh, you know, the, the case wasn't, um, it, was, it was deemed this is a fair use of copyrighted material is to create an index across, you know, all the knowledge, all human knowledge. And now, you know, we just take it for granted that you can go to Google and you can search the contents of, of any book. And, you know, in terms of the um, positive externalities for, you know, humanity, I think that that's huge. And I think it's probably just the same thing happening here. I think the bigger question is the, the capitalist model around that, where, you know, the, the money and the power goes to these, technology companies and and isn't distributed in a more um equitable way yeah yeah mike c from wellington uh asked about whether history is going to repeat itself in terms of inequalities the ability to create llms well, you know will mm. it remain in the hand of companies with money um you mentioned the um the the authors guild obviously we've got a strike happening in hollywood right now the hollywood um the writers guild of america is on strike and uh I now, wrote, now is not the right time to go on strike well, I mean, the studios are already in trouble. 
Uh, and yet what they're fighting for, it's interesting, like I wrote a piece, it, it is, there are parallels with what they're fighting for and what the Luddites fought for. You know, when we look at the Luddites, our, our common understanding of the Luddites is that they were backwards, they were anti-technology, they didn't like progress, and we use that now as a pejorative term. Mm. But in fact, the actual story of the Luddites was that they were actually super pro-technology, they wanted the technology to be used fairly, and they wanted to be able to uh, share in the upside of it instead of having it be used uh, basically to uh, eliminate jobs to make uh, shittier products uh, more cheaply uh, and to consolidate wealth for the owners. Mm. And uh, in fact, they only smashed machines for owners that refused to negotiate with the workers. They, they left the, the owners that treated their workers fairly alone. And that seems to be what the Writers Guild are after. I, is there a way through this that helps us support uh, greater equity and rather than greater in inequity and inequality? Yeah. And look, I, in some ways, I think this goes right to the heart of the you know, capitalist system that, that we find ourselves in the West. And so, you know, AI and technology is, is really just a logical expression of those, you know, of those systems. Um, and, you know, I don't have an answer for this. There's a fascinating book, um, Katharina Pistor uh, wrote about it called um, The Code of Capital, which talks about how, you know, over, over history, um, the, you know, lawyers in back rooms have basically done deals to encapsulate the commons um, and enclose, you know, what was previously common and, and, you know, held by everybody and privatize it. And then to use public law, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, basically to enforce that. And so to put it on the statute books over time. And so we, we, we are in this place now where, you know, we have these concepts of IP ownership um, and, and so on, which, and, you know, this is my IP, says Google. You, I have a patent to this. You can't do anything with it. You know, so when did we all agree to this? As you know, as a, as a, and that's and those that's just baked in to hundreds of years of legal precedent. And I wonder whether now the logical expression of that is AI, you know, creating trillionaires, you know, a trillionaire is going to happen in the next 10 years, you know, um, and you know, more and more concentration of wealth um through through the system. And you know, is is it time to have um to really go, you know, go hard and look at alternatives so Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the positives. We only have okay. about 15 minutes left. Oh my God. So I just want to start with a, a lighthearted one. Um, so I'm a really avid photographer. Uh, I love to shoot my kids, uh, rugby, my stepson's rugby games. <clears throat> and uh, what I can tell you is that uh, now that generative AI is a thing, uh, those rugby games have gotten way more intense. <laughs> so, uh, you know, all of a sudden things become a lot more fun, I think, uh, in terms of what we can do just, you know, uh, in our personal Personal yeah. uh, let's talk about some of the other positives. Um, what do you have? You've done some really interesting stuff lately with open. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, 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 um, so, you know, one of the things that I, yeah, so I was uh, chatting to Bernard Hickey. I'm a great fan um, of, of his work and, you know, really is this prolific conscience of, um, of our heroes. Uh, you know, I, I basically, how do we, you know, make a better out of row for the future? But I was, I was, you know, chatting on his Substack chair and chat, and really, you know, I, I I look at one of the challenges we've got with government, as I see it right now, is it's just not set up to scale, right? It's this big bureaucracy um, that that is not not well architected. And if you try and interact with government on an API basis as a technologist, you know, I just want a, a mobile app. I think there's a big opportunity missed when most, you know, a whole bunch of the country got a, a government app on their phones um, with the COVID app, and then that that you know, for, for whatever reason, wasn't sort of capitalized on. It's like, well, can I access some more services? Can I get some, you know, look at mo more of my health information through that? Um, but uh, yeah, so I just went to uh, ChatGPT and, and said, you know, I want to provide an API for all government services. Um, you know, write me the full API reference documentation. And it just did it. So here you go. So, you know, I don't know if you can read that, but you know, the New Zealand Government Services API prefers a unified and streamlined access point to various government services including public records, licensing benefits, and more. The API aims to simplify and automate the exchange of information. Yeah. So authentication uses OAuth2. Rate limits, uh, you know, talks about the usage of it. And then it goes into the endpoints as a public records, licensing, benefits, taxes. And, you know, you see it all sketched out. Incredible. Um, yeah. And then I just kept up, uh, and then it sort of finishes up. Then I just went to the, you know, the great thing with ChatGPT is you just go, all right, carry on. Um, <laughs> and so I did it about three more times. It's like, now just expand the list of endpoints. And it just kept going. And so, you know, housing, justice, business. And you can just imagine, like, what if government was actually just an API? You know, yeah. Could you actually, you know, could you actually, would it actually function 
the same or better than it is currently. I think it's a thought experiment that's worth doing. I love it. Do you know what yeah. that brings me to mind is the concept of latent demand, uh, yeah. which is one that um, uh, that came that Thomas Cuello, uh introduced mm. to me. Um, and so a lot of people get concerned about, you know, is AI going to take all the jobs? And one of the things that we see is that with AI, it unlocks our ability to do a whole bunch of things that we've wanted to do, but we couldn't before. And so, you know, an example is uh, when we first introduced ATMs, a lot of people were like, oh, the bank tellers are going to disappear. But in fact, the bank tellers, number of bank tellers exploded because people had more access to their money uh, rather than less. When we introduced spreadsheets, people thought accountants would disappear. It turns out it's really useful to be able to know more about your money. And so the number of accountants exploded. Um, uh, when I look at that, um, that API documentation, I go, you know, everything that we imagine, like, wouldn't it be great if we could X, that is now accessible yeah. to us. Oh, um, you can just dream of, oh, you can, I mean, from as a creativity tool and as a productivity tool, it's great. And this is just one example. This is like a, a new national museum for New Zealand, five stories high on the Auckland waterfront in the style of Zaha Hadid. Incorporate, incorporating traditional merit carving. Sorry. And stable diffusion came back with those five concept, those four concept drawings in five seconds. Yeah. And so as a way of just like, you know, imagine, and this this picture behind me, you know, just imagining what would it be like to live in GSD's doom times in a, in a um, you know, in, in the bush or something, then, you know, it, it's as an imaginative aid, I think it, it's going to really just lift us up. And of um, course, immensely. that one example has just highlighted some of what we were talking about before in terms of IP was in the style of Zaha Hadid, yeah. uh, as well as the concept of data sovereignty and uh, recolonization of Maori. <laughs> so for example, you know, you, you go on there and you go in the, incorporating traditional Maori uh, carvings, and those systems don't know what is tikanga and what is not. Uh, and so again, it just becomes so incumbent upon us, I think, to to really start to grapple with some of these issues. Um, I, I've, I've definitely been reading some stuff in um, uh, uh, Etangata about um, Maori data sovereignty and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a, new a sense of urgency yeah. around how we engage with some of these systems. Um, we had a question here from um, Jared Kelly, who wants to know your thoughts on how this technology could positively influence education from primary to tertiary. Yeah. Oh, immensely. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I, I would admit, first of all, I don't really get education. I'm sort of an autodidact. And so um, I, you know, I've never had a problem with like, oh, I want to know this and then just going and finding it out. Um, and so, but I saw, I mean, one just one example was um, Sal Khan from Khan Academy recently just put a, um, you know, they, they've been working on a GPT-4, you know, chat assistant, which is like your personalized tutor, basically. And so, you know, really encourage He did a TED talk, but I think, um, just if you go and find it on YouTube, he did a, sat down and did a 25 minute demo of, you know, using, I think they call it Khan Migo. Um, and so it's really just like a, a tutor that will take different voices and, you know, be your sparring partner or be help you to do the inquiry or help you to reframe um, your answers. And so it just helps you on that learning journey. So, yeah, I think as a way of just, you know, lifting everybody up and that's probably, you know, the, some of the early evidence we've seen around, um, you know, what chat, chat, the GPT-4 model is able to do is certainly it's able to pass exams at a human level and, you know, in medicine and in, in law, but it's really also just able to lift a lot of people up that perhaps, you know, did have struggles with literacy, did have struggles with numeracy before, and, you know, really just give them the world's knowledge at their fingertips and a, and a personalized coach. Yeah, it really, uh, you know, I, I see some, we mentioned this earlier, uh, some folks in the education world wanting to limit, wanting to know how can I make sure this wasn't produced by AI. I, I saw a better example, which is actually requiring students to produce something yeah. with AI and then having them go through it, critique it, edit it, uh, check its sources, uh, determine its accuracy, its fidelity. Uh, and so I think that's a much smarter way to go about things because yeah. The AI is here. It's not. We're not going backwards on that. Uh, how can we make sure people are skilled and sophisticated users of it? Is a much more powerful opportunity. Sam, we've got a couple of questions here. Sam Ragnarsson. Hey, uh, Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, asks about going back to the discussion on verifiable credentials. Uh, whether the authenticity and uniqueness proof of origin will become the IP rather than the thing itself, and the traceability of using such IP as a framework for something. Yeah. 
I, I mean, that, that, that's why the web. A combo. Okay. It's a combo. Uh, we also had a question uh, from someone, uh, which I've kind of lost. I'm trying to find it here, asking whether uh, blockchain, uh, we're seeing, you know, blockchain being used to determine whether something is AI generated or not. So sorry, over to you. Yeah, no, I, look, I, I think the um, the trust questions that we've, that we touched on right at the very beginning that you know you really don't know what's uh true from fake and you don't know the authenticity um of uh of any piece of content whatsoever um you know we, we need ways of uh digitally certifying authenticity um at scale you know so at the scale of the pile um or, or whatever's you know whatever the, the model has been trained on really all the inputs that's you start with that and then build up um and so, you know, there's lots of encryption technologies uh, and blockchain, you know, is one technology that, that may help to solve um, some of those challenges of really just providing an encrypted uh, checksum, if you like, that this, yeah, this um, information is uh, is authentic. And then, you know, NFTs um, are potentially, you know, one use for that is, is you know, just to uh, having a, a point on a blockchain somewhere. But I think the technology has got a long way to go yet. It was Annabelle Fernandez who had asked that question. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, and of course, there is a substantive difference between uh, authenticity and accuracy. Uh, and so, you know, mm. there, there's a whole bunch of information out there that is totally authentic, but wildly inaccurate. Yeah. Uh, and how we understand the difference and the distinction between uh, I mean, this comes down to decentralized trust. Um, and so, you know, really having a network of, of people, and, you know, a lot of these problems have actually been solved um, you know, at scale, for example, in the Ethereum proof of proof of stake um, mechanism, where you know you have a, a network that is resilient to uh, to to attack because of its decentralized trust mechanism. Um, and so, yeah, I think you'll probably see some mechanisms build up on top of that kind of um, yeah decentralized uh, yeah, blockchain technology. Yeah. Yeah, we had a question uh, earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll have to find it. Sorry, um, but who asked? Someone asked about um, uh, prompt injection, like malicious prompt injection. Prompt injection. Yeah. Basically, we are at a point now where um, you know cybersecurity. If it wasn't already top of mind for you, if you're a leader of any kind in any kind of organization, if it wasn't already top of mind, it needs to to get top of mind pretty quickly. Um, we have time for I think just maybe one or two more questions. Uh, this question comes from TAC Room Three, so I assume it's someone who. Who is sitting in TAC room three. Uh, is there a danger of AI generated AI? Uh, that is to say, one generation of AI building uh, the, the next one, Absolutely. improvement, danger. Yeah. That's where we're at. That's, that's how GPT five, GPT four is currently building GPT five, guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. Okay. Well, so that, that was, that was it. Short and easy answer. Uh, we've got a question here, uh, which is about uh, generative AI being used to augment human creativity 100%, uh, which within is it coming from, the human or the generative? Uh, look, uh, Mike, I'm going to have a, this is Mike from Wellington, I'm going to have a crack at that question. So um, uh, uh, Gary uh, Kasparov, uh, the chess player uh, who was beat by IBM's Deep Blue uh, years and years and years ago. Uh, it was kind of the first major public example of an AI, you know, humiliating a human at that human's expertise. Uh, he came back from that and he ended up uh, doing a whole bunch of initiatives where he was working with AI yeah. in order to play chess and setting up teams. It's a centaur, half, half human, half AI. AI. A centaur, there we go. Yeah. And what we found is that the um, combination of human AI can will beat either AI alone or human alone. And so that gives me some measure of hope that we've got, you know. Uh, but whether it whether it's 1% human and 99% AI, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, absolutely. Uh, all right, I'm trying to get to as many questions as I, possible. I, I was going to say that that particular question, I mean, that's very, um, I, I'm very aligned with, with, with that in that, you know, this is technology to augment ourselves with. And, and personally, I'm very comfortable at this. We're all cyborgs now right so we're, we're all carrying phones around and externalizing our memory you know into the cloud and you know soon we'll, we'll have some kind of augmented reality goggles um you know that the, the interpret the world around us so you know I, I think it's all just part of a journey since we started using tools um you know way back and, and creating fire right so where, where it goes who knows but um, i'm quite excited by it
Um, Genesis has a question. <laughs> Any suggestions on how to get the machines to rise up to destroy the current baking system and level the playing field? And this is how humanity dies. <laughs> but, like, but seriously, like this is this is what happens is that people go, I wonder what would happen. Like capitalism is broken in so many ways. I wonder what would happen if we destroy capitalism. I wonder what would happen if we unleash it to wreak whatever havoc. Uh, yeah. What are, what are your thoughts, Ben? <laughs> I, I think capitalism has, I mean, if you look at um, a lot of the, you know, statistics, Hans Rossler's book, you know, it, the world is getting much better, like life expectancy is going up, health outcomes are better, literacy outcomes are better, um, you know, there's less, there's less war, um, you know, statistically than there was previously. So, you know, I think there's a, a lot to be said for the outcomes of the capitalist system, but we have uh, anthropogenic climate change and we have a, a impending biodiversity collapse so the capitalist system we have is not yeah. um looking at the externalities the environmental and, and ecological externalities so i think it's instead of destroying capitalism it's really about you know modifying it so that it, that it incorporates the cost of what we're currently not um accounting for yeah okay uh what do we think uh how do you think ai could help with the mental health sector anonymous attendee yeah um uh, so and actually do a little bit of work um in that space so you know the basically you know, straight away going back to the carmigo example was just to have a personalized you know mental health coach coach um on, on, a, on a chat basis i think you know there's there's certainly concerns um around that but basically the the ability to sort of be able to ask questions and be coached um in a, in a chat interface you know just it, it means that you're not waiting in a queue waiting to talk to someone or, you know, have a face-to-face -face appointment. What, um, can, and, I, can I just add to that? What yeah. I say on that front, uh, oftentimes the resistance to that is, but it's not the same as having a human. Mm. And uh, yet the accessibility, you know, all of a sudden people who don't have access to a human have access instantaneously yeah. to something supportive. There's also a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association that looked at a bunch of medical questions on Reddit had them randomly allocated, some of them answered by a verified physician, some of them answered by chat GPT, and then had a group of, uh, of trained physicians assess the responses. And it was like, you know, the, the, the answers from chat GPT were rated 10 times more empathetic than the answers from the verified physician. Yeah, totally. And you can, you can train to do that. Um, and, and also, I mean, I spend all my time, you know, wearing this sort of whoop thing and measuring all my biometrics. Um, and that's really good at coaching my physical well-being um and so you know I, I think the aspects of mental health are very tied in with physical well-being and you know ai is one of the tools there that can help with that ben i knew we were going to get to the end and go we could keep <laughs> going for hours i yep. always love talking about this stuff there is so much uh richness in this dialogue uh what i would say is this conversation is only the beginning not only for us but for everyone who's on the call uh this stuff is here it is real it is happening it's part of our lives we need to be uh doing everything we can to understand it uh right this brings us to the end of our hour we do have a survey that we would love uh for you to um to fill in for us whoopsies just lost my survey, hold up. Uh, I'm gonna chuck this survey in the chat. It will take you just a couple of minutes. Uh, please, please, please fill in this survey straight away. Uh, we have a couple of events coming up. We have the Etsipu Aifama uh, World Conference 2023 about the future of food and fiber in Aotearoa and around the world. That is happening on the 19th and 20th of June here in Ototehi Christchurch at the Town Hall. Please do join us for that. We have our Transformational Executives Program coming up on the 26th to the 20th. 8th of July, where we will absolutely be diving into this topic and many more. Uh, when, and we have our transformational directors program coming up on the 20th and 21st of July. Uh, all of those are on the website. Ben, thank you so much for taking oh, your time to spend an hour Kyla. today. Kia ora, thank a privilege. You so thank you. Thank you for everyone for all the really insightful questions as well. That's Great cool. questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to more of them. Thank you everyone for tuning in uh, and spending your sacred non-renewable time with us. We're so grateful to you. Kakite, have a wonderful day. Take good care.